Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and I want to welcome you to this bonus feature for Episodes 9 and 10 of Hidden Secrets of Money. And if this is going to be a, a little bit different than the bonus features that we've done before. You know, when you watch a movie, a lot of times there's bonus features, and in there there will be one with some audio commentary from the director or producer or something like that, one of the actors. That's sort of what this is going to be. I'm going to tell you some of the backstory behind these two episodes. One of the things that I wanted to point out is, you know, all of the footage that is shot in Hidden Secrets of Money is all our footage. Uh, we've got a couple of animators, and then Dan Rubach, the producer, director, cameraman, editor, lighting, he uh, 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 picks out all of the music, so basically scores the film, and we license all of that. And there's very, very little stock footage. We do buy a little bit of old footage. But everything, all the time lapses that you see, everything in there is all Dan. And I wanted to show you the beginning here of Episode 9 because it starts out with a little bit of the Colosseum, and you see the light change. And this took a couple of hours to get this shot. And, you know, it looks pretty simple, but it's uh, Dan sets up a tripod, and he's out there before the sun comes up, and he's filming after the, you know, well after the sun goes down. So here's the Colosseum, and basically if you look at this busy street down here, there's a line painted in the middle of it here, a couple of lines, and this is about three feet wide. And Dan uh, would set up, he'll, he'll just walk right out into the middle of traffic and set up on the line in the middle of the street, and cars going by and stuff. It's, it's, uh, it, it looks sort of dangerous to me, but it doesn't seem to phase him at all. But he'd spend uh, an hour or two in the middle of the street, all of the time lapses on Wall Street and uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> all of this is original footage and, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. so that he can go to the Lincoln Memorial and shoot uh, the sun rising and these beams of light coming into the Lincoln Memorial. Pretty amazing. Uh, now, this is, is the scroll that the, the timeline that the whole two episodes were based on. And this is done by uh, Aiden Magnus, and Aiden is our 3D animator. And he does all of this beautiful work, and you'll see more about this scroll later. This is more of Aiden's work. This is the Temple of Saturn in Rome, and you notice the columns here, the pillars, and then it dissolves into the real ruins of the Temple of Saturn. And, you know, as you watch these, you start picking out, seeing all of these details that uh, Dan and uh, Aiden and Lincoln uh, did. This is all orchestrated by Dan. Uh, he, and then it dissolves into the U.S. Treasury. So you've got these three images, that, and... You know, when we went to Washington, D.C., I don't know if this was six months or a year after being in Rome, and Dan's trying to get the same angle, you know, and I didn't see any of this going on inside his head. I was just there watching it, and he had to get a certain angle of the treasury and stuff. I didn't know what he was planning on. But he uh, gets these shots planning on something later. Steve Forbes. I just uh, really enjoyed meeting Steve Forbes. And uh, I was at a conference, and he was a speaker, and we had an appointment to meet. And uh, I had rented a suite in the hotel that, where we could set up all of the uh, cameras and stuff. And he came up with his assistant. And his assistant is no one to be trifled with. A very quiet, large gentleman with a gun. <laughs> He's got a bodyguard that, uh, I mean, uh, you don't want to mess with Steve Forbes because you're going to have to answer to his uh, bodyguard. Uh, but I loved Steve Forbes' examples of 
you know, imagine if they changed the foot every day and there was so many inches in it in one day and so many in it in another day. And the clock, floating the clock, where the minutes change each day. These were wonderful examples of how unstable it makes our monetary system to have all these floating currencies that don't have a true established value. And, you know, I show this chart because one of the things that Steve Forbes said in the in episode number 10, and I, <laughs> he said it so nonchalantly, and there's a part of it that a lot of uh, people would take offense to, and it's the truth, what he said. There are two ways of getting ahead. One is to steal from your neighbor, and the other is to provide a product or service that somebody else wants. So you, know, so you can uh, do it in trade. That's where prosperity comes from, is creating a product or a service that somebody else wants. Well, here's a, a chart from the Fed that I just created, and, and this is total government expenditures. So federal is about $4.2 trillion of this, something like that. But uh, when you add in state and local, it's right around $7 trillion that they spend on all of us each year. Well, there's 330 million people in the United States. So if you divide $7 trillion, by 330 million, you get this amazing number: two one two one two one two one two and two one 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 two one, or whatever. But it's twenty one thousand two hundred and twelve dollars per person in the United States that the government spends on us one way or another: the military, this, that. But this is basically, you know, sometimes I sort of draw the analogy of um, entrance to life as an uh, entrance to Disneyland. You're going to go into this amazing society and we've got roads and buildings and we've got cars and we've got all of that stuff, sort of like entering Disneyland. And the cost per ticket is $21,000 per year, uh, per person. Uh, if you're not paying $21,000 in taxes, per person. So this is, you know, $84,000 for a family of four. What it really means is this is the break-even point. Anybody that's paying more in taxes is paying more than their fair share. Anybody that's paying less than this in taxes per person is paying less than their share and getting, receiving. Somebody else has to work and produce more than they consume and then that is taken away from them and given to somebody else. If you're paying less than $21,000 in taxes, and I, that this is just a brutal truth, then you're receiving uh, something from somebody else. Um, Rick Rule. I just love this guy, and he is so incredibly brilliant. And have you ever heard a more eloquent speaker? I thoroughly enjoy being you know, in his presence and, and talking with him. He's uh, just an amazing guy. And the piece that he did with these animations that Aiden did, you know, uh, this was $10 gold certificate in gold, you know, $10 uh, in gold payable to the bearer upon demand. And then Aiden uh, has uh, Nixon come through it and Notice the different images. You know, he's smiling here. He's moving his arm around. He's got a pen in his hand. He crosses out the gold thing. And then he rips the bottom of this bill off, and he's pointing at you. And you got to go back and watch the episode again. His eyes blink and stuff, and his arm is sort of waving around a little. Aiden did a great job on this stuff. Uh, this is another one of Aiden's 3D uh, renderings. And uh, you'll notice there's this family walking across here. Now, Rick Rule has just described how we get to print this lie and ship it all over the planet. And you see these trucks. There's an elevator that uh, was out in front here, and these trucks were leaving, uh, one from uh, Brazil, one from Germany, and one from Japan. So we ship them these dollars, and they ship us real goods and services. And then this scene dissolves to this, and so it's basically the, you know, it's the Bureau of Engraving. And this is a family that was walking in front of the 
Bureau of Engraving when Dan was filming it. And uh, Aiden matched it all up so that it just dissolves and they keep on walking. The flag keeps on waving. Ron Paul, I cannot tell you how much respect I have for this man. And we've been to his office a couple of times. I've, I've interviewed him a few times, but we went to his office and um, it's in Clute, Texas, which is a little town. And, you know, I was sort of joking and saying they had one traffic light. Well, They've got at least three, I think. Uh, There's probably more than that. But it's a small town. It's got a major highway running through it. And uh, Ron Paul is a very modest guy. And he lives a modest lifestyle. Um, You know, I heard that for uh, years and years, like more than a decade, he drove his old Chevy Chevette wagon. Now, the Chevy Chevette, this was a car that was made in the 70s and maybe into the 80s, and it it, uh, competed competed with the Ford Pinto. So it was the smallest car and the least expensive car that Chevrolet made. And I I heard that he had a a station wagon with wood paneling on the sides, and he drove that for, uh, you know, uh, quite a number of years while he was in Congress and stuff. But the thing that I want to point out here is notice that behind him is the flow chart, the diagram of how currency is created from our episode four of Hidden Secrets of Money. He led us into the office and led it in the very back of the building. He's got uh, his studio and he just let us set up in there for a couple of hours. And then we went back into his office and got him and, and uh, did the interview. But what a Wonderful, charming, honest, cordial guy. He is so genuine. Uh, one of the things that I tell people is it, watch him in some of the old presidential debates that he would do against the other candidates. And there would be a question from the moderator, and he would answer answer instantly. He wouldn't take any time to think about what his reply was going to be. All of the other candidates, first, they would get a question, and they'd say, First, I'd like to thank the people of the great state of Florida for having... And they do that because they're trying to figure out how am I going to answer this question without offending these constituents and and, and then I don't want to offend these campaign donors. And and so they're trying to figure out how to answer this question without offending anybody. Ron Paul says what he thinks... Uh, and it just comes straight out, and he's never flip-flopped in all of the years that he was in Congress. He voted the same way. If it wasn't in the Constitution, if the Constitution didn't provide for it, he didn't vote for it. I have incredible respect for this man. Now, we're going to get into Nixon and uh, some inflation here, and and you'll see the head of uh, Emperor Diocletian, and it says 284 uh, to 305, This is not his lifespan. Uh, He was born in 244. These are the years that he was emperor. So he was emperor for 21 years. He actually lived to 66 years of age. Now, this is an animation that was done by Lincoln Jude, all of the hand drawing that he does. And Dan has inserted uh, Nixon into the TV here that Lincoln drew. And um, this is the recording of the uh, event where Nixon took us off of the Bretton Woods system, the last vestiges of a gold standard. And then it goes to Nixon. And this part, when I saw this for the first time, it just sent chills down my spine. I couldn't believe, you know, I don't get to see all of this stuff being produced on a daily basis. We, we go out and we film stuff Dan and I traveled around the world. This is shot in 18 countries. And I stand in front of the camera and I say stuff that I, you know, history, stuff that I uh, know from studying all of this and writing my book and so on. I say it. And then later on, Dan pieces it together. He also does some of the writing for this because uh, we've got a lot of these disjointed parts that, that I have said and and they need to be filled in so when you hear voiceovers sometimes it's me but most of the time Dan actually wrote the parts for the voiceovers but when I saw for the first time 
Nixon dissolving into the head of Diocletian, and Nixon's lips are still moving, and he's telling us about these drastic measures that they're going to take and install wage and price controls, and then it's coming out of Diocletian's mouth, and the same words did come out of Diocletian's mouth, roughly the same words, seven, more than 17 centuries earlier. You know, this this is, you know, you're talking almost 2,000 years here. 1,700 years earlier, Diocletian is basically giving the same order. And then here, we're doing the same stupid mistake instead of looking at, well, how did it work out in ancient Rome? How did it work out in during the French Revolution? Uh, we don't ask those things. So this 90-day wage and price freeze you know, uh, we cut to 21 months later, and he's introducing more measures because the wholesale prices were up 2.1% in one month. That was just for a month. And then commodities had risen at 16% annual rate, and he was introducing more measures this, these wage and price controls, there were actually four different phases to the wage and price controls here. And I remember this period of time. I remember seeing on the news Walter Cronkite and Dan, Dan, Dan Rather and all of these uh, newscasters. But I remember seeing pictures, uh, gruesome pictures, of live baby chicks being scooped up by a, you know, a tractor that had, you know, one of those scoops on the front of it and picks them all up and dumps them into dumpsters while they were alive because it was going to cost more to raise them than the farmer could sell them for. So all he could do was get rid of them. And peach farmers, you know, Peaches have pits in them. The pits are really strong. The peach farmers have to put gravel every few years on the uh, dirt roads that run between all of the peach trees because, you know, if, if they get too muddy, a machine can get stuck. And so you can pave the dirt roads with a little bit of gravel once in a while to keep them from turning to too much mud, or you can just dump all of your peaches on it and let them rot and the peach pits are left. And that's what they were doing was paving their roads with peaches because they could not make a profit taking them to market and selling them. And so I started working about this time and I had a van with commercial plates on it and I'd carry samples around and I worked for my father and I was was a traveling salesman. And because I had commercial plates, I could fill up on any day. But the average person, if your license plate ended in an odd number, you could only fill up, you could only pull into a gas station on odd number days. And if it was an even number, you could only go to a gas station on even numbered days. And so there was gas rationing uh, in place back then. Uh, so it was really quite a brutal time. And so I've got the, um, uh, an inflation chart here, and this was when he made the announcement that there was a wage and price freeze. And then they had the uh, elections, <laughs> and they lifted after the uh, wage, they, li they lifted the wage and price freeze after the election and the pent-up energy. It just started to soar. And so they had uh, phases two, three, and four uh, in here. That second announcement 21 months later was sometime in 1973, so that would have been in here. But you can see it just kept on running. Richard Dottie. This guy is so incredibly funny. Now, the first time I met Richard was at the Silver Summit in either 2003, 4, or 5. The Silver Summit used to be a really small uh, convention. It was held in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And um, Richard Dottie, a.k.a. the Mogambo Guru, uh, was there. And he still writes uh, articles. Uh, you should look up some of them. But, man, he was funny. Um, when he was, uh, he was a keynote speaker at one of these silver summits, and he was talking about Alan Greenspan creating 
currency like a drunken chicken pecking at the button the button on the keyboard print currency print currency and <clears throat> he was shaking the lectern and stuff he was the most animated speaker i've ever seen he had everybody just rolling in the aisles it was hilarious um now toward the end of episode nine uh, i talk about the depression of 1921 the only reason i bring this chart up here you know here's the great depression and this is the monetary base so it's the uh, um, paper currency plus the gold was a part of our monetary base back then um, but you see gold can't disappear but a whole bunch of the paper currency did it vanished during this huge deflation of 19, 19 late 1920 and, and all through 1921 and then in 22, we started this expansion called the Roaring Twenties. So this is the Roaring Twenties right here. Uh, this deflation is the greatest deflation that the United States has ever seen. But uh, it was free market, and, and the government didn't rush in to save us. The Federal Reserve didn't do anything, and the economy healed. Uh, this is the Great Depression starting, and this was an entire lost decade. Now. I started presenting this back in 2005, 6, and 7 uh, when I would be on stage with Robert Kiyosaki, and I wrote it into my book in 2007. Uh, my book came out in 2008, and I saw this first when I was reading Milton Friedman's Monetary History of the United States, which he wrote in the late 60s or possibly the early 70s. It goes up to 1965, so I think he wrote it in... 66, 67, 68. But it had these amazing charts that you could unfold out of the book that were about three feet long. And you could see that these had been hand drawn because I could find places where you could see that something had been erased and then moved to corrected. And um, when I saw the huge uh, uh, deflation in the currency supply, and the producer price index in this, I went, oh my God, that's not a recession. This is a depression. And so I started, re I, when I would go on stage, I would say, how many here have heard of the depression of 1921? A whole bunch of hands would go up, and I would say, 1921, not the crash of 29 and the Great Depression, the depression of 1921. Every hand would go down. Nobody had heard of it. And uh, then it was in my book, and I used to mention it in videos. And the first thing that I can find where somebody else wrote about it was 2009. So I'm pretty sure I'm the one that coined this. Uh, in uh, 2015, Jim Grant wrote a book that I believe is very well researched and documents all of this uh, called The Forgotten Depression. Uh, it's probably a, I haven't read the book yet but it's probably a book that everybody should read. Um, and the only reason I include these shots is just to say we do license uh, some stock footage, but pretty much everything that you see in these videos and all of those beautiful time lapses and stuff, that's all Dan. Now here's another wonderful animation uh, done by Lincoln Jude. So this is all hand drawn. And um, so we're getting into episode 10 now. But I want you to notice this archway here, and then there's this uh, building here with these this sort of uh, curly Q cornice or what I don't know what you call this uh, stuff on the top, and there's a bell tower over here. And then watch this. We're going to dissolve this, and there I am, and here's that build those two buildings, and there's the archway that the soldiers uh, marched through, and you got to watch these things a few times to start catching this stuff. I mean, it surprises me. I didn't see this the first couple of times that I watched it. And uh, the detail that goes into this, uh, some more of Lincoln's beautiful animations, and then you see this dissolve. And I think this is just wonderful, the detail. that uh, And Dan orchestrates all of this. And there was one part... <clears throat> this is a little bit of backstory. There's one part here where I'm talking about, you know, the demise of the Roman Empire due to deficit spending and war and all these people touring the Colise Colosseum and wondering how many of them think about, 
you know, we're going down these same roads today that brought down the, the demise of this great civilization. What happened was the reason I was saying I was in this, I'm sort of talking quietly. It's because out of the corner of my eye, I can see security coming up. To film in the Colosseum or up on the Acropolis, you have to get permits. And these permits, like in, in Greece, they were having a lot of financial trouble back then, and they still are. Permits could take years to get, so there was just no way to do it. We had to just do this ninja style. And we had this big old professional television camera. I've got a microphone, a wireless mic, hidden inside my shirt, and I can see security out of the corner of my eye coming towards us, and I'm sort of talking quietly. And then as soon as we end the shot, they step in and they want us to come to their offices. And so we're walking back to their offices. This isn't uh, one of the, but there's all these alcoves and side passages and stuff all over the Colosseum. So I've got my assistant, Damian Ramos, with me and, uh, and uh, myself, and we're walking with these guards, and Dan is walking behind us a little bit, following us with the camera, and he's got a backpack on. And he, as soon as they look away, he darts off into one of these little side passages, and he goes to the other side of the Colosseum. And in his backpack, uh, he had a change of clothes. It was cold that morning, and he had been up since before the sun filming, uh, getting all those time lapses and things. And then we meet him, and we were filming in the Coliseum. And, and when we're walking back with security, he darts off, goes across to the other side, and, <clears throat> and changes his clothes complete, completely, takes the memory cards out of the camera, stuffs them in his uh, sock, uh, he, he entered the Coliseum wearing like jeans and a long sleeve shirt and a backpack. And then suddenly he's got a uh, short sleeve shirt, shorts on, uh, sunglasses, a cap, and he's carrying the uh, backpack instead of wearing it on his back. And he goes to the exit and they've got all this security and they're looking for us. You know? <laughs> These security people are looking at everybody. And then the minute that they sort of turn away and talk to each other, he goes through all the little turnstiles and gets out of the Coliseum. And uh, the security still had Damien and I in their office for quite a while. But without, <laughs> without the memory chips and without the cameraman, there's nothing they can do, so they let us go. <laughs> so that's the backstory on the James Bond uh, uh, stuff that Dan did to get the footage that we shot out of the Coliseum. So uh, <clears throat> the Max Kaiser piece, this was wonderful. And, you know, if you go through uh, all of this, you'll see a whole bunch of hidden gems. The Mindless, Mon Mindless Monkeys talk show, uh, was, this was part of the, but uh, they put in little messages like this all over the thing. Uh, bad credit loans approved, no payments until 2039. So we're all high on, on uh, free credit and, and uh, sugar and, and cheap drugs. And this is red beer instead of Red Bull. Uh, and Max is telling us that... <laughs> and we had to get this into an episode, one of the episodes of Hidden Secrets of Money somehow because when, he, when we interviewed him and he said that we were spinning our tits 24-7, 365... <laughs> I just thought that was so hilarious. So now it's officially in an episode. Uh, the government can't create prosperity. It can only consume it. And this is absolutely true because uh, when they take a dollar out of the real economy to do something for us, there's a whole bunch of government employees that need to be paid, all of the bureaucracy. And so they take a dollar out of the real economy and then they put 80 cents or 75 cents or 60 cents or something back into it. And so uh, a certain percentage of every dollar they take is prosperity that gets consumed. So less prosperity comes out the other end of government. Now, I wanted to show you some of these time lapses. These are just single frames. But notice that there's you know some... Um, stripes painted on the ground here and Dan has his camera set up just in the middle of this street and there's traffic and there's three lanes of traffic here and there's some blue lights way over here 
and you'll notice that this car changes lanes and then turns like right in front of Dan. So there it is. And what you're seeing, there's four frames here that get uh, overlapped. So these lights coming out are from this same car. And uh, these lights and then this pair of lights is also the same car. And it cuts right across, just right in front of Dan. And then notice this, there's a motorcycle here. And here's the next frame. <laughs> it's like coming right at him. And then it zooms back into traffic. And this just goes, this is a bus that just went by. And it's actually a lot closer than it looks here if I went back another frame or two. Uh, but, you know, a bus coming up from behind you and just whizzing past your shoulder. Notice this motorcycle. And here it comes straight at the camera. And there it is, like, right in the camera. <laughs> and then, zing, it's back into traffic. And then this is a bus that just, I mean, right next to you. Is, and Dan was there for, like, a couple of these time lapses. you got to be there for at least 15, 20 minutes, but sometimes it's two hours. Uh, Fiora de Zucca. This is just an amazing restaurant, and we found it because we were at this wonderful hotel that was um, near the Rome Zoo, which is where the uh, consulates are. The American consulate was a few blocks away from our hotel. And we got to the hotel rather late. It was just after 10, and the restaurant had closed. And so I asked the hotel manager, uh, where a good restaurant wa was. And the uh, manager said, oh, you just go up here two blocks and over another two blocks and then up another four blocks. And here was this wonderful restaurant in the middle of a residential, just a, a neighborhood. It's a family restaurant and it's the best food we've ever had. It was just absolutely awesome. And, you know, I spoke with Roberto, the owner, and if you, you need to go, if you go to Rome, you really need to visit this restaurant. The laughter in there, the funny thing is, though, if you go at 7, it's empty. It doesn't start uh, filling up until 9, and people are, it really gets going by about 10 p.m. This is just the way Romans eat. So go and meet Roberto, and the, every, the laughter that's going on in here, the, the families that are having fun, and uh, it's just got a wonderful atmosphere. And the waiters have such a great sense of humor. They're just hilarious. Roberto was just such a nice, genuine guy. And to see that he was suffering from all the same problems that I was suffering from with my business in California and the regulations and so on. But if you get a chance... Definitely eat at Fiora de Zucca. I highly recommend it. Grant Williams, you know, I've got such respect for this guy, uh, and he just doesn't, um, there's not enough people following him. Uh, he puts on these marvelous presentations. Uh, go to realvision.com, look for one called Nobody Cares. That's an excellent presentation from the Silver Summit a couple of years ago. He did a a presentation about the market crash of 1987, the stock market crash of 87. And it was a big crash, and you don't get a sense of the scale of it until you listen to the interviews and the uh, presentation that he put together on that. It's absolutely phenomenal. I have a lot of respect for him. So uh, definitely uh, take a look at some of his stuff. I just put this shot in here because of the hours and hours that Dan spent over a couple of different trips doing time lapses and different angles of the Federal Reserve. Chris Martinson, I just love Chris, and he is just an absolute genius, and he's got such a gift for explaining things to people. This piece that Aiden put together here, you know, where Chris is explaining exponential growth. This is already, they've put the water on the ground and it's already filled the stadium and you can see a reflection on the surface of the water of the billboard here. And this is Chris and me sitting on the edge of Candlestick Park. I probably should have said the Coliseum in Los Angeles because they tore Candlestick Park down. You know, 
it took the first 400,000 years, you know, all of human existence, to get to 3 billion people and then just the next 40 to put the next 3 billion people on the planet, and that's exponential growth. So 400,000 years to 1960. And so if you take 400,000, 40 years is one one one-hundredth of 1% of all of that, and the Earth's population doubled in that one one one-hundredth of 1% of the time that humans evolved, uh, that we've had modern man. And then this shot... Chris and I just uh, looking up at the earth and then Aiden's shots. You know, first it shows farming here and then these oil pumps and oil derricks start springing up. By the way, I lived in Southern California and there were uh, oil der- oil uh, pumps like this uh, all over the place and oil derricks. And I used to play in the oil fields when I was a kid. And I used to climb up and I would ride these things <laughs> when I was like 12 years old. And I would climb to the top of these uh, oil derricks uh, where, the, you know, when they're drilling, uh, they build this rig and they've got a section of pipe and it drills down and then they screw on another section of pipe and it drills down and so on. Aiden, he just popped more of these things spring up and then you've got jets and then we go out into the ocean and we go underwater for a little while and you see tuna being caught. And then when you come out, the farms are gone and what you've got is... Federal reserves springing up everywhere, and what we're growing now is the currency supply. There's federal reserves all over the place. And if you don't watch this and pause it once in a while, you miss all of this stuff that they added. But uh, exponential processes speed up at the end, and that's true. They get very, very fast. And we're coming to this point where we're overpopulating the earth, we're Uh, uh, destroying our purchasing power with extra currency. I just show you this shot because you'll notice when you watch these in many of the episodes, there's a slow motion shot and then there's a bird that flies through it. So Dan will do hours of slow-mo shot. You know, he's doing time-lapse photography where you to get a uh, 10-second clip may take... Uh, five minutes to get that 10 seconds. Except if you want to get a 10 second clip that has a bird flying through it, you may have to sit there for an hour instead of 10 minutes. And then a bird flies through it. Now you've captured uh, what is the bird of freedom, maximum freedom. So that ties a lot of the episodes of Hidden Secrets of Money have this uh, a, a bird flying through a slow motion in slow motion on a time lapse shot. So now we're at the end of this, and this is the scroll again, and there's the entire scroll. Those that's the backstory on uh, the hidden secrets of money episodes nine and ten. Uh, and presenter Mike Maloney, I actually did the least amount of work uh, in all of this. The animators, Aiden Magnus, Lincoln Jude, just uh, the amount of, they put an immense amount of work into these things, uh, you know, working, you know, when they're about to come out, these guys are working very long hours, seven days a week, and then uh, all under the direction of Dan Rubach, uh, who shot all of the live footage, edited everything, uh, scored the thing. Uh, wrote a lot of the dialogue, um, and uh, so uh, music, lighting, uh, just goes on and on. The talent in this group of people is immense. I'm incredibly proud of them. I'm proud (coughs) of the uh, work that I have been able to do. When I see these episodes come out and I see them uh, on YouTube, I feel like I've made a difference. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time.